Welcome to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to welcome all listeners from around the world to Mobility Innovator Podcast. I'm your host, Jaspal Singh. Mobility Innovator Podcast invite key innovators in the transportation and logistics sector to share their thought about the key changes in the sector, about their work, and what is their forecast for the future. Today, I'll be speaking with an amazing entrepreneur. He has worked in academia, consulting, in corporate world, and startup ecosystem around the world. He worked in North America, Europe, Asia, and Middle East. He's currently the CEO of Citigroup Company. City Group Company is providing public transport and on-demand mobility as well as warehouse servicing in Kuwait. Prior to joining City Group, he was the co-founder and CEO of Earner Mobility, running a micro-mobility platform in Middle East. He had a long career in consulting space with PwC and developed corporate, innovation and digital strategy for public and private sector. Some of his key projects include developing innovation strategy for $25 billion cross-rail project in London, developing Dubai Innovation Index, and innovation automated fare collection and marine transport strategy for road and transport authority in Dubai. I'm so happy to welcome Dheeraj Bhardwaj, Group CEO, City Group Company. Now it's time to listen and learn. Hello Dheeraj, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Hello, Jaspal. Thanks for having me here with you. I'm really uh, looking forward to sharing some of my experience and it'd be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, So today I'll be spending time getting to know about you, about your professional journey and your thought on the innovation in the mobility sector. Uh, To begin with, I would like you to share a little bit about yourself with our listener. And also, are there any interesting facts about your career that are not on LinkedIn? Sure. Well, the LinkedIn is a very linear uh, profile uh, system, but let me just give you quick glimpses. I spent first 10 years in academics. I strongly believe that academic rigor is good. You can do everything. If you know mathematics, you can do anything in your life. Then almost nearly more than 17 years, I've been in the industry, jumping between a consulting and the industry and using my knowledge of consulting applying into the industry, going back to consulting, learning new things, applying new things. And in between, I've done few startups. Few failed, few successful. That's the highlight of my... <laughs> That's great. Uh, and I, I saw you have such a wide uh, experience, you know, jumping from academia to corporate world and then consulting, building your startup and then coming back to the corporate world. And And that's something I want to and more. So you did your PhD in computer science uh, from IIT Delhi, uh, and then you did your MBA from Imperial College London. You started your career in India and played a key role in the development of India's supercomputer firm, which is which is really amazing to see that uh, you you were participating in those kind of initiative and in helping the country. And after that, you moved to academia and worked with IIT Delhi. After your stint at IIT, you played an instrumental role in transforming the construction industry in the UK and Middle East. Uh, and later you led the strategy, digital and innovation at PwC and work on various innovation projects. You jump from one industry to another and, and try to establish uh, your feet everywhere. Uh, in 2019, you co-founded uh, your micro-mobility startup in Dubai. And now you're working as a CEO of City Bus Kuwait. Uh, I have two questions. You have such a wide experience, work as an innovation consultant, strategist, pitching new idea to CEO. And now you're working as a CEO and listening to those ideas from the consultant. So how does world look like from both sides, from being consultant to CEO? How do you see those ideas? And the, the second question which I want to ask you is, a lot of people think about startup is only for young people and uh, fresh graduate and all. I mean, you're still young, so it doesn't mean you're old, but uh, you did launch your startup after a very long professional career in the corporate and consulting one. So any lesson for other executives who are still not sure about launching of their own or still thinking about to doing something their own? Well, let me answer the first question. And as the consultants, I highly respect consultants. Consulting is, is a great profession and I advise to all the young people who are starting their careers, they should spend two to three years minimum, minimum, uh, you know, working as a consultant. Consulting gives a lot of structured thinking, it gives you exposure to the lot of uh, the different types of businesses, different types of leaders, and it's it opens up your mind totally, completely, and and yeah. opens up for learning new things. 
and keeping yourself abreast with the, all the latest developments all the time. And then, as you said, that since I'm on the other side of the, you know, the, the table, I still respect and I still interact with the consultants. I respect their, their knowledge and I need to be because we are focusing on a one particular industry. These guys, the, the consultants bring knowledge from different industries, different yeah. sectors, and they, are, they, they, they bring you new technologies. So, so, so that's, that's how I see the consultants. But the one other thing which is very important with the consultants when I see on their side, and sometimes I laugh at it because sometimes they don't know the, the, the operational reality of the life. Yeah, and in, in and highlights of one of the highlights of my career is that I've seen the both worlds, so I can clearly see that what consultant is saying is doable, and what is not doable. Yeah, right. So that's that's my view on the consultant, but I do respect them a lot. Um, on the startup side, I don't think that there is an any age for startup, right? And then the very interesting part on the startup is so, so I, I give you two things, right? The, so we are living in a world. If you look at it as a macroeconomic uh, aspects of it, we are in a world where the digital acceleration is is, is at a super fast speed, right? Or yeah. technology acceleration is super fast speed. So the businesses have two challenges: they have to remain relevant. If they are not relevant and they are not up to speed, they can go out of the business anytime, right? And the second thing, which the, usually the consultants use the term called "fit for the future," what mm. means is that you got to be, have a very operationally, you know, very efficient. So operational improvement and continuous operation improvements are extremely, extremely important. And this is where digital transformation come into play. Yeah, you know, the, when you talk about the, the relevant means you are customer facing, when you talk about fit for future, it's your back office thing, right? And if you think what it means is in a reality world is you've got to be agile and lean. Yeah. And, and ready for the challenge and change, right? And what, where you learn this, you learn this in startups. The startups are the great, 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 you know, the, this place and platform for me, I have many few failed, few successful startups that the learning is that you have to be on your feet all the time. Mm. And when you're starting you don't know what is coming, you oh, don't yeah. know, right? And you, you should be able to change, as I said, the lean and agile, that's what, that's what is needed. So. To me, to my advice to the, all the business leaders is very simple, right? Always remain in a startup mode, right? I even a, because the, I mean that's that's how I, I see it, and and I love these startups, and I'll continue to do these startups. So as you see in the recently, I'm still into the startups, not just doing my own, but also I believe in it. I invest in those and support these startups, and I have a good portfolio of investment in these startups. Great. Great. No, thanks for sharing these uh, interesting point. And like your first point about consultant, I fully agree being a consultant myself. So I know sometimes, you know, you see different world, you get an opportunity, but, uh, but the sad point is sometimes they are not connected with the operational reality. Sometimes your suggestion come out from a purely from a theoretical way on a, on a PPT and you never, and that's what I tell people to be on the ground and see their operational reality first before making any recommendation. Like you can't just make one change and uh, it's always has a ripple effect. So as a consultant, you need to understand that ripple effect. And uh, yeah, there is no age for launching a startup. It can be as young as 18 or 15, or, you know, I wish my kids who are four to launch their first startup by seven or eight, uh, or or it can be 70 or 80, you know, and, and good to see you're connected uh, in this world and supporting. Why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so can. now for... Yeah. Oh yeah, and yeah, that's a, that's a plan. Uh, probably lemonade stand first, and then something else. Now, following up on my previous question, uh, you had such an impressive uh, career journey and work with amazing company. Why did you decide to join a public transport company, and that is in Kuwait, where public transport is not very popular, I guess. And uh, also, if you like to share a little more about City Group and its operation, you have recently mentioned that you created a digital and greener future strategy 2026. Uh, I mean, as a consultant, you will be always thinking about creating some kind of a framework and model to transform the public transport in Kuwait. I would love to know what is the background story of moving to Kuwait? Interesting. Um, so let me tell you, so I love challenges. I love challenges and I, chal I keep on challenging myself, right? And I love change and transformation. And that's what, that's what you learn uh, 
you know that's what you learn in consulting and and that's what you learn in your probably you you, you learn from your this is in dna simple as that let me keep it this way so you know and another thing which is very important for me is i love to make world more affordable a livable livable place for future generations right and there is a something after i moved from academic to the to the business world so let me share a little story i had few startups when i was a professor professor at iit delhi and i invested my own money into it and a lot of efforts and they failed hmm. the failed reason was that the two reasons one was when you are in academic institution like iit you are always ahead of time that yeah. was one reason yeah the second thing is you think that technology is everything you do not understand that technologies only do not make money right you got to have a commercial acumen and understanding how businesses operate how they yeah. make money commercial aspect of it so i decided to do my mba right full time mba at the age of 35 but after leaving the professorship of iit it was a crazy thing to do but i just did it because i thought no i want to make my startup successful no more failures and i will learn the business and then do it the interesting thing happened is that when i after i finished it and i met the the, the chairman and the owner of langer road who's a who's a who's a really a pioneer in in construction industry he said to me there is a 40% waste in in construction and so in transport right and i said what what is he talking about what do you mean by waste at that time my to me the waste was the waste which you throw every day right? yeah. and the and the guys pull up but they are we talking about all the six different types of whatever six seven types of waste which are which you learn in six sigma the process waste and that's all types of waste efficiencies yeah. and all and that was the important that was the triggering point for me to start thinking oh that waste is serious that is the that's what i got it that this is the what is making world inefficient and this is what is making world uh, you know not good it won't survive hmm. it, it world needs to change this waste has to come out to make it a livable place for future generations right and this is where i entered into the the construction side of it and very small little story that i was given a single task by the chairman i was not civil engineer i am a computer science mathematics scholar no clue of civil engineering right but he wanted to bring somebody who doesn't bring any baggage of the, the construction yeah. he gave me one task he said i want to build without scaffolding right then what i did was and the scaffolding was a new term for me i never knew about it yeah. never heard it. <laughs> it's new for me yeah. too <laughs> let me tell you what it is so you know when you see the construction sites and you see all the pillars and everything where people yeah. go up and down and they covered that if you think of it there's a total nuisance and why do they have this scaffolding because the production of the construction is on site hmm. and that's where you have everything under control that's where you have these wastes and it becomes very risky people die falling from different places unsafe environment to work for people and it's dripping water and everything unsafe for the community and it makes noise right my simple solution was in 2006 2007 this could production has to move to a controlled environment in the factory hmm that was a change and in 2007 i gave them a, a formula a 70 60 30 00 70 30% 0, 0. 70 of the construction product goes to the factory right okay you design in a way that you manufacture that will reduce to 60% labor on site because there is and then 30% your reduction in your program overall timeline Hmm. zero afr accident frequency ratio because now you're no longer asking people to climb on the these these poles right and the production is in a controlled environment and zero environmental you know impact by offsetting carbon right and this work was supported by this gentleman and the ceo of this and we changed this that was a great transformation great so you your, your whole construction process is rather than institute construction is does design manufacture assemble yeah and it brought it brought so much of predictability in the in the program in the cost and everything 
because you cannot do this until your design is complete 90% or plan is complete 90%, right? That was an amazing, it took me six to seven years, six years, literally six years to transform a lot of money, 200 million pounds investment in an advanced manufacturing facility. So you need a will to do that, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was lucky to work with Rayo Rourke that who had the will and he changed that, transformed that thing, right? Believe it or not, nearly 30 patents over the six, six years I protected for a construction company, 30 patents, unheard mm. anyway, yeah. right? Now, the same thing, when I was working, I was very much involved in the number of projects in the transport sector, right? So I was working involved with the, the cross rail. They were building it at that time in the program management, project management. I was involved with the London 2012 Olympic Park to delivery. And, and, and I wrote the cross rail strategy anyway. And then um, and I was also involved in a, from a PwC on the aircraft kit. Hmm. So, all the aspects, right? Right? <laughs> they, even <laughs> in the submarines and everything I, I've worked on. Aircraft carriers. Uh, so, one of the things is, if you think about the cities, where the cities are really, really suffering, is because of the, the, the poor public transport, in, 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 in particularly in the eastern part of the world, right? I would yeah. say, far eastern Singapore, Hong Kong, done a great job, but if you look at Middle, Middle East, even India, the you know the, the transport people still think that you know the transport is means people love the cars right they think yeah. means the car the cars and expensive cars are the public transport but they don't even have I mean look at it a forty ton of metal and one person riding it how good is yeah. it yeah. right mm-hmm. so so that that is one of the reasons why I thought I think the next next transformation where it's needed so next transformation needed is the public transport. So if you can make houses off-site and bring, do this off-site and, and bring in the city, and if you have a transport, which is public transport driven, your cities will become livable places. Yeah. Very tight. If you go to city, most of the cities are always, so as you know, that the, the, anything you design in the cities are designed and the buildings are designed, typically in a places like London, commercial buildings, and most of the buildings are designed for 35 years. After 35 years, you need to renew them. Yeah. So cities are suffering from this continuous cycle of constructions and improvements and everything. And you know, this diversion, that diversion, this, that, right? If you think of it, if you can start manufacturing in the factory, start assembling, we can shorten these periods, we can have these nuisance going away, and you have a vehicles and which is shared mobility as a kind of a public transport. Cities, we cities will do amazing, right? They'll become a livable place. They will create more, you know, opportunities for people to do things, and that's one of the reasons why I moved into the the next step is public transport. And let me tell you that we, the, after this, there's there's something else to come. It's all around, you know, environment and all around, you know, how do we make this this earth more livable, right? Considering the how the country is right. Now the next question you said about about Kuwait, you said about Kuwait and Kuwait city bus, right? Yeah. Kuwait was an interesting because when I was in the Middle East and I was involved in a number of projects in Kuwait, I did some transformation projects in Kuwait as well, and as as I did in Saudi Arabia, in, in Dubai, I I noticed that Kuwait is far behind uh, in public transport and it needs a lot of help uh, in terms of, you know, making the changes quickly and see the see the results very, very quickly, right? Yeah. And this, this really creates... To me, the opportunity is, as we call in, as we call it, the low-hanging fruit. I, I saw that in terms of transformation, where you can make really significant impact in a very quick uh, time frame, and there, I thought that's, that's a great place. And Kuwait is is a city, is a country, and it's it's not a very big place to test few new things yeah. in in the changing environment and changing world. So I thought, let's do it. And you know, as I come to the city bus and city growth. There's our key brand at City Bus. So we have two businesses. One is uh, the public transport. Second is the uh, is a warehousing business, right? Which is for the F and B, logistics warehousing. But the, the key flagship business is City Bus, which is a red bus, double decker, single decker buses, right? I think that we are the only one who have the double decker. We are the only one in, the, in Kuwait who run double deckers. Most people don't believe in that because 
the, the even the authorities here believe because of what have believed that we run too many buses and we cause the the traffic congestions on the streets oh. and in in the in the in the downtown area particularly and i i i talk about and i think about you know the what is the one line you say that this is the best uh, public transport if you have a smooth and safe transport that's the, yes. that is the what you need to do you need a smooth flow of transport and a and a safe transport that is the true identity of a, of a good transport system. so if you think about the smooth and safe i mean what we are seeing is that buses is, is a great example the bus is a, bus is a fantastic example of you know uh, public transport so that you can move big people it, it is kind of a not a perfect last mile uh, first mile solution but it's still it's not very far from there it, it covers both sides if the roads infrastructure supports you and integrated with other modes exactly in, so the kuwait doesn't have other modes by the way but uh, not many other modes but we have only <laughs> system and uh, i call it so I, I divide the whole public transport into three spaces you have the mass transit you have micro mobility you have a soft mobility yeah. in a, at a, at a broader level so kuwait has the the mass mass transport is only the buses and there is a micro mobility which is mixed of many things primarily the people love the, the expensive cars and and gas guzzlers and, and i think the pickup trucks are the most popular in kuwait as as opposed to uh, abu dhabi where the rolls royce are most popular. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so city bus is a, is a is a 20 years we have just completed this year 20 years running the and we are the market leader we run we take about 55 to 60% of the market share and in terms of the ridership in terms of the revenue as well as the market uh, we run the largest fleet and we run the nearly about you know, 400 buses, uh, the, okay. the size buses, single deck and double decker. While overall fleet we run is about 800 to 900, depending on the departments. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we are digitally very advanced. Uh, even now, um, we have the city bus app. You can do a planning and tracking. We use you know paper cost systems to to have the live uh, the bus route environment, uh, route uh, information where the buses arriving when his bus is leaving and you know we continuously investing in um, in the in the operational systems we have introduced the first digital fuel management system no, nobody in kuwait has ever heard of as well as a uh, lot of other in the, uh, you know a lot of other technologies which we are bringing in to have our as i said fit making us fit for future yeah you know become more efficient become more you know and and also we also are investing in the new technologies as you see in terms of the scheduling planning dispatching we're building a new command and control center we just have all the cctv cameras which is ip cctv cameras okay. fitted in all the buses which is not also not which is not only helping us but it's also helping the, the authorities the, the city the, gov- the government so like the, the the police and traffic even if there is any incidents happen around the, the actually the traffic the police department comes to us for the video recordings mm. to provide them the video recordings to provide from outside inside everything which is which is a great uh, so this is how this is helping us in the overall transformation in working together with the authorities and giving the confidence that we are with them we are not we are not their enemies right yeah we are yeah. And working operator. working closely yeah so we we are private operator but it's still we are true uh, you know the public transport operator oh yeah yeah that's how that's how we want to build our image that's how we want to do it. and also yeah. you know like you're working in a public space so you have to cooperate with these civil authorities uh, police uh, the traffic department and transport department and work with them and provide yeah. no I, i i love your this formula of 70 60 30 zero I think it can be done for transportation as well. We need to think about how to <laughs> make what, it zero, what? zero emission, zero accident, yeah. those kind of a stuff in transportation as well. Absolutely. I mean, and that's and the the thing is, yeah, it's it's a big transformation, and we are we are there. We are moving towards that that direction. Great, great. Yeah. Now we learn more about uh, in in following questions. Uh, so my next question is about uh, your 
professional journey in Middle East. Uh, you spend nine years of your career in Middle East and work in different country. Like you mentioned, you work in UAE, you work in Saudi, you work in Kuwait, and I'm pretty sure there must be other country where you have done some project. And you mentioned that public transport and shared mobility were not a priority in these country. Uh, most of these countries are car dependent society and all, but things are changing uh, dramatically now, I would say. We are seeing investment in rail infrastructure, metro, light rail, buses, other mode in last 10 years. How do you think the next 10 years will be different compared to the last 10 years in the Middle East? If you would like to share evolving social, demographic, and technological trend in the region compared to what's happening was earlier, but I think now society is much more connected and changing, like you just mentioned. Sorry to add one more point is how Kuwait will be part of this journey. Uh, currently, there is no rail system in Kuwait. Like you mentioned, it's only mass transit here, me in the buses and doesn't have any other uh, infrastructure. So you don't have an integrated public transport infrastructure in the country. But what are the plan in future? How Kuwait will also emerge as a city which is investing in these infrastructure and make it much more integrated with other parts of the world. Like we saw Qatar, because of the FIFA game, they have redeveloped their whole country. How do you see other Middle Eastern countries will follow? Well, it's a, this is a very interesting question. And I think this is one of my favorite parts, which I, I share with every forum I speak at. Well, if we look at it, fundamentally, what's happening in, in the in Middle East? Fundamentally, if I tell you that they are going through so-called industrial revolution in, in the Western world, right, which yeah. has gone through the three industrial revolutions, right? That's what is happening in the Middle East. In kind of industrial revolution or civilization revolution or whatever, say, you can say political, social, technological, industrial revolution. It's it's more more wider than industrial revolution. I, I, if I say they put the industrial revolution, industrial revolution draws the same thing. Yeah, that's what is happening now, and that's now what is happening is they are catching up, but at the same same time they also know that they have to move forward, yeah, fast forward this because the catching up is too late, right? But the good thing is that you know they have they know what to they have the learnings from the West, so that's that's what is happening. So let me let me tell you where the where the transport is. So if you look at the fundamentally in any industrial revolution, there are three fundamental things. Communication, transportation, energy. These yeah. are the three fundamental infrastructure technologies which has done the which have done the industrial revolution. Look at the first industrial revolution. The steam press, you got the newspaper, right? Then there was a coal which gives the energy. And then there was a locomotive, uh, you know, was built by the Britishers and it became the transportation, right? Yeah. So communication, energy, transportation, these are the fundamental. The second industrial revolution was the, the internet. Sorry, uh, was the, the telephone, right? Telephone. But the internet, internet wasn't, a, I don't believe the internet was a uh, was a radical change or as a, it's really big, but the telephone, the remotely talking to each, to, able to talk was the very big uh, innovation, right? That was a communication. Then there was a fossil fuel invented by the, the Texas, in Texas, by the cheap, cheap Texas oil. And then Henry Ford built put the the build the the cars into it, right? Second industrial revolution. Third industrial revolution is now you have the internet, the web. The energy is going into more sustainable, more distributed. Right. Your you know wind energy, solar energy, and you know district energy, and 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 the transportation changed to Uber, right? Or digital. IoT based, right? All yeah. the all the shared mobility, all these mobile apps. That's the third. I don't think there is a fourth industrial revolution. If you ask me, what is the fourth industrial revolution? To me, it's it's what's happening in Middle East, right? What's happening is Middle East of that revolution, right? So if you think of it for economic development or any economic activities and economic movement, these three fundamental technologies play a critical role. Yeah, transportation, very very fundamental. And I think, and this realization is as happened in in the Middle East, right? So transportation, they they are building up the whole transportation system. They have learned that what are the benefits and what are the, you know, having these uh, the trams and all all these, uh, you know, the systems. What they have seen in the Western world. Let me tell you something very interesting, and you will be surprised. In Dubai, 
there was a very interesting system that any public sector employee going on their on their own holidays yeah they had to bring wherever they're going in the world they had to bring at least two ideas right after their holiday and to submit to the government to to to, to their departments oh so it it's is, mandatory it's like every it, employee it, it was mandatory ah, i don't think i don't know whether it's there today or not but it is mandatory fantastic system right <laughs> So you go there, you learn, and you know you see these things, and and these things are like you know the knowledge gathering, knowledge collecting system. Yeah, right? I mean it's amazing. It's, it's so if you see it, and out of that there is an evaluation process, and and maybe we can talk later about it. But what I'm trying to say is that this is this is what they 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 understand that what is the benefits. I mean look at it. They love the cars. They're here when they go to the when the Middle East go to the to the to the europe they use the same public transport right and they, they yeah. know it the benefits now so riyadh has as you know the saudi arabia has invested heavily heavily into the metro system in jeddah riyadh and everything dubai is continuously investing in it now the question comes the kuwait kuwait is a is an interesting place it's a small place a small country a small city by the way they are they are planning to uh, they are planning to build the rail system but okay. as you know i kind of have a some sort of a assessment of my own point of view that it will be very difficult for any country or any city to build the metro system or rail system so easily hmm. because the, the, the planning and the planning planning for the rail system and and the construction takes minimum 10 years oh yeah right and it takes billions of billions of dollars right and the business case for having those it's is totally different it's it's you know you it's very very hard to make any metro system to make profit right yes if you have an objective to reduce the you know uh, reduce the public transport uh, reduce the traffic congestion and all those things when you're suffering for it you need it you definitely need it i mean nothing can be can beat the, the metro system in terms of you know in terms of the, the the convenience in terms of the air pollution in terms of making life easier for people you know but it's just that you need a big will you need yeah. to need a will to to build it and have a patience to to have that now whether kuwait will have it i have no idea but there is a plan and is plan being it has been in the past been reviewed and revised and 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 they they're going to have it Hmm. most likely they're going to have it because there is always uh, the neighboring countries in the region or at the, within the countries there always a competitive competitive you know the you know the, the struggle or competitive uh, you know i'm just missing the word but spirit. they have to competitive as, spirit uh, as to, to... right and and then they have to compete with each other right they cannot be they cannot let themselves behind the other the neighboring countries as you know the etihad rail is a major project oh yeah between in, in the region and you know this etihad rail project is going forward going ahead and there was a point uh, you know there was a point then when we thought that the other rail will not happen but now it's it's it's, it's, it's being done right you, they're having right it so so the, the the other thing is that you know the kuwait not they have to build the rail infrastructure i think the best strategy for them is to have not just for the passengers but have to have for freight as well and connect with the neighboring countries right yeah yeah so I, that, and i think that's the advantage of rail infrastructure that you can use it for multiple exactly uh, yeah. purposes yeah. so the freight passenger uh, it can be it can be good and it can reduce the carbon emission and and also the traffic on the road uh i yeah. i agree with you there is a lot of changes i'm also witnessing in middle east and like you mentioned uh communication energy and transportation are the fundamental pillar for any change and we are seeing that uh, there is a lot of transformation happening in these space and middle east is going through the transformation and there is a competitive spirit among these country uh yeah. which is good and i think that should be the way you know you want to be the best place to live you want to be the best place for for people to move around and work and that's what these countries are trying to do and we will see a lot of more development happening in next 10 year where the young people are taking command and uh, changing the cities and changing 
the surrounding and and there is a movement about leaving your car and use the public transportation the best infrastructure yeah i think i think there's another thing which is the you know the the young generation part as you really touched upon i think the young generation is understanding the need for the you know environmental sustainability and they oh, yes. they're quite and they they are more uh, concerned about the environment and they they choosing and and see that they are seeing that the technology changes and they are seeing this these all the things are available to them they're not rigid into having the drive in the car right oh yeah and then yeah so you know i think i think uh, there's a bright future uh, that's what oh, i yeah. see oh yeah no you are you are at the the right place uh, at the right time uh, making that revolution uh, and being part of that revolution so which is great yeah. now you are doing a lot of new project uh, at city bus as well like you mentioned uh, city bus is investing a lot of digital infrastructure in fact i love founder who promote their own brand uh, you are you are promoting right now the city bus shuttle service brand yeah. which you just launched like 10 days back uh, so firstly many congratulations on this initiative i think it's an on demand bus service you launch in kuwait so i would like to know more about this project uh, also what is the business model uh, of this whole city bus shuttle service in beni city uh, they see on demand buses as a replacement for fixed line but i i'm curious to know how you are seeing city bus shuttle in in context of kuwait and what is your key objective is it to increase ridership or save cost or improve efficiency what what are you going to achieve with that and do you think this service will help people to move from their private car to public transport uh, what is you want to achieve with this service right so so let me just just tell you so this is we call it a, this is more of a complementary service rather than the substitute for the city bus right as you said okay. as i as i said that we 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 clearly segregate have three segments the mass transit micro mobility and short mobility right so the mic- mass transit we have the, the city buses where we have a separate uh, you know we have a very clear segmentation of the customer segmentation right this is more affordable this is more uh, for the people who must who can move more people together than that right yeah. but then this we call it this one this service we call it city link uh, shuttle right and this is it's a very interesting story uh, uh, jaspal that we as you know that i attended the one of the events with you at at kalsru right we talking about on demand on demand on demand and i found that most of these on demand services are actually uh, run by the fund, run by the public transport agency, public transport agencies which are funded by the government right yeah more of a public organizations if you see uh, for a private operator it's not it's not quite common yeah right and all of a sudden this triggered in my mind that no on demand is not the right term right so I, i'll come back to that but but in terms of the the, the city link shuttle the reason why we needed this micro mobility was because the way the road infrastructure in kuwait and it's more in most cities right it the way that the whole the hierarchy of network road infra yeah. network is is you have the main roads then you have the you know the cross road then you have the the collector roads and then you have the local streets yes the public the and the local streets and collector road actually create the need and demand for the last mile or first mile uh, you know and if you do not have the first mile last mile solution what happens is people pick up the car oh yeah right and then if they once they pick up the car then you are in a car now you you will not go somewhere park your car take the mass transit and go to your destination because you know what will happen the next same story right you're not at this side the other side is also you have a challenge so that gap was very very clear in most of the cities which is the last mile first mile gap and that is that has become in the last few years that has become my in a magnet in my mind so i had the startup in at least in the, in the in sorry in uae which was about the electric scooter startup right just to cover the last mile first mile yeah a similar thing in the, in kuwait the considering the temperature and road infrastructure i think that that that's not feasible so what you need is you need to pick up the you need to reach out these shared vehicles a micro mobility shared vehicle smaller vehicles closer to the people's homes and closer to the people's where the people's appointment to places or their offices are the way they need to commute yeah right now the problem the, the, the difference is that when you have a mass transit you are when you are a public transport you have to continue to run on a route right oh, yeah. because that's the nature of the public transport right 
Now, if you want to run on the local street, first thing you will do is you will do the congestion. You will do, you know, choke all the roads. Second thing is you will burn the fuel and you create a more car CO2, not good for the environment. So this has to be something different. So we pick up the term, which is called demand responsive transport, right? So this is a, this is not an on demand. This has more of a demand responsive transport. It's a shared mm -hmm. vehicle based on the digital app and very yeah. smart algorithms behind it, right? So you basically, there's a very tricky thing we did. And I think this is a quite a unique uh, that we want to make it more proper. We want to make it a profitable while helping the city, while giving the right, you know, the prices, which are not. So one of our pricing point was the, the pricing strategy is more than the city bus, the public transport, and less than a taxi. Mm. Right. And somewhere in between, which is, which is affordable, which is attractive to the people, which, you know, which makes people think before they pick up their cars. Yeah. And and the quality of the, the vehicles and the quality of the vehicles is is, is is extremely, extremely good, right? The, our buses are fragrance. We, we use the fragrance because in summer, as you know, in Kuwait, it's very hot. Oh, yeah. Another very interesting thing, if you think about that, where we differentiate the ride hailing, for example, or a taxi service. The problem is taxi is that I'm not against it because it's still, you need taxis. Totally against it, sorry. <laughs> but you are very close to the driver, right? You're very close to the driver. If you're, if it's country or place where the taxi services are not regulated, I'm talking the examples of Singapore and Dubai. If you are not regulated at the level of where Singapore is regulated or Dubai is regulated, taxi, you know, the, the taxi users suffer from several things because of the you being very close to the driver. Hmm. This service, you're not talking to driver at all driver is operating you you communicating with the driver in the through the digital system right it's a fully automated driver doesn't need to you don't need to interact and you have a place where it's a very very comfortable ride you can do your work you can take a nap you can talk you can listen music you can interact you can do anything right yeah it's a, it's a, and it's a, a, and the way we have done it is very optimal way we have launched this in in the, the core pockets of this, we are not running everywhere. We're running in the, the where the demand is. We call it, we have a strategy, the two strategies, chase the demand, chase the customer. Mm. Right? So this is this is how the, 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 the city link shuttle is being designed, right? Making it oh, more yeah. attractive. And so let me let me just give you the very interesting customer segmentation. This may may not work in every part of the world, but it does work in the part of the call it blue collar which is the people who have a certain category of people who are working in, you know, on the construction projects and all that yeah then we call it a pink collar uh, the people who are more skilled labor who are working in a more sophisticated environment they have a and then we call it white collar and then in, then the kuwaitis the citizens we call it. yeah so this service is targeted for people who are skilled people they were skilled people Right, who work in a sophisticated environment, who work like you know, young in, in early stage of their careers. Yeah. Right. They need more affordability. They are more environmentally conscious. Right. And and that's the that's the target market we have kept it. Right. This service we evolve a little bit more uh, into the subscriptions as well, so people can book it for the whole month at the same time, but they can use it as they, as they pay as you go. Right. And the good thing is this is what this will do is this will reduce and this is something we are we are monitoring we have started monitoring the economical social and and, and the environmental impact of our service we have started measuring it because mm. uh, i keep on saying to everybody is that if you are not measuring if you are not scoring you are not playing you are got to go. yeah. we have started measuring right and we really want to measure the, the all these impacts that how our service is going to create these. So one of the measure is that this service, how many cars we are taking off the streets through this service, that's one of our key measure, measurement. That's that's quite interesting. And how do you do that? Do you ask people? Uh... We, do, we do ask people and then we have a mechanism to, to see that if you are moving these many people and you know we ask these people, how do you, most of these people are using the taxi or their personal cars. 
Ah, so okay. we have created a feedback form in a as a little feedback form with three questions. One of the question is, right, prior to this, how did you travel? Hmm. And we have the option taxi, city bus, or car. Okay, so right? you're seeing whether it's taking share away from public transport or it's taking share away from these private transport, uh, the cars and other modes, which yeah, is interesting. I mean, it's interesting for us. The first thing is we don't want to cannibalize our, our yeah, own right. business, right? That's one thing. But still, we know that from the people we pay, our buses do not come because these are very tight, very crowded, mobile streets. They cannot mm. come. You cover two very key interesting points. One, you mentioned about that it's important to see how public transportation, it's like carbon emission per passenger. So even yeah. if it's a bus, uh, but if you're carrying only five people instead of 40, and so per person carbon emission may be more than the car. So you need to make sure that your service, actually the overall objective is to reduce that carbon emission per passenger, not just claiming that the bus are more greener than than the car, because if you're not doing that, that's not true. And secondly, this demand responsive, you rightly mentioned, if you're not measuring, you're practicing, you're not playing. So all the public transport agencies, they have to have some kind of a KPI or measurement to know how the service is actually helping the public transport system or taking away people from the car. Like you said, you don't want people to get bored with hundreds of questions, just three questions, ask them what they were doing earlier, what's their future plan, and and make sure that they get a good service, reliable service, or any feedback or suggestion for them. And and giving the subscription will be interesting. So uh, actually, you are uh, you're doing interesting stuff because many of the city they are not doing subscription. They feel it as like one of the trip. But if you can bundle it as a subscription package, uh, it will be compelling people to use it every day rather than think about Absolutely. before starting their journey. Absolutely. And then th that is what is the, so people have to go to work every day. Right? So it has to be a subscription uh, model. To do that. In yeah. fact, my next yes. question is about your uh, automatic fare collection system, because you mentioned to me that you are doing some innovation in that area. You're planning to launch this account-based ticketing as well as open loop payment system in uh, Kuwait. So I'm very curious yeah. to learn more about the new ticketing system you're planning to launch and what is your plan to integrate other players in Kuwait, including your competitor Kuwait Golf Link and taxi operator and, and any other mobility player. Are you planning to integrate them as well with your fake collection system? Very interesting. So AFC, considering that I have a lot of experience in building writing the strategies in AFC in the Middle East and, yeah. and in India. So most people, to me, the AFC is not just a ticketing system. It's not just the ticketing system. It does more than, a lot more than this. And the way that the new AFC we are bringing in, it's not just the ticketing system. It is integrated with the, the three things. One is it has the ABL system, automated vehicle location system. Okay. And then you have the ticketing system, which is has a pass, smart card, passes, and everything. And and the and the third thing is a mobile app, which you do your planning, your book your tickets, and you pay for it, take the ride, and you can have a wallet. Right. So so the AFC is a truly is is your it, it is more than ticketing. That's that's how yeah. I, I I see. It. Yes, I mean the now the why the why the the card centric architecture was there because there was no 5G, there was no you know no no not many satellites in the space, right? So now it's it's very clear that if you are bringing a new AFC system, it has to be account based. There's, yeah. there's no, I think that nobody can go back to the the card based. Open loop is interesting because you know there are several ways of making. Uh, so that, as I said, the smooth and safe transport, right? The flow of transport. The mass transit systems need a, 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 the, the, the number of passengers who take the journey. And, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a lot. And in certain times, it's very difficult for any the driver to issue the tickets easy. Yeah. Right. So I think I think uh, that's that's one of the task aspect is that when you have a mobile app where people can pay through the mobile app, they don't need to you know, worry about it. And, and that's how that's and this is a, and I would say that this is the way we are saying we are digitalizing the mass transit. Hmm. 
right? Because now your a, this ABL system is connected to your, you know, the, the, the passenger information system on the bus stops and passenger information system on the mobile. Like what else you need, right? This is this yeah. is like a is this is the digitalization for the customer customers, right? From a customer facing side of it. So the interesting bit is that in most of the world, the AFCs like a Noel card in Dubai, Oyster in, in, in London, and you know, Octopus in Hong Kong, these are developed by the public transport authorities, right? Yeah. Not by the private operators. Because in Kuwait it's not done and it's we are not seeing any any will for it. So we decided to do ourselves. And of course, our business model, because this whole, the, the, our part, technology partner and the business model is such, why to limit to ourselves? Hmm. Why to limit to ourselves? The same technologies, and this is where we are going to do is we are going to go to even to our competitors saying, you don't need another technology, right? You just come and use our technology. There's a really interesting thing I've seen in the, in the recently in the AFC world or ticketing world, that some people do not differentiate between the seat reservation and the AFC, hmm. right? They think that you can buy through some planning, you can create a ticket, QR code, and you validate it. That's the AFC. No, that's not AFC, right? So anyway, so there, this is there is a bit of an education piece in this part of the world, right? And there is a great opportunity, and we are building up this whole new, uh, you know, business model. Any proposition, any product and service, to to actually go in the whole region. Like Saudi Arabia is is our target market. Oman, the Oman recently have done it, but you know, there are a lot of private operators. Oh yeah. Because this is not just a ticketing system, as I said, this is a full, still digital solution, and that's what okay. we are doing. It and and probably, I would say, if you bench somebody benchmarks, we will be and we will not stop there. Probably I'll ask, ask you to, well, we can discuss later, but this will go up to the super app. Yeah, no, actually, that's my next question uh, about the super app because you are very bullish uh, of building super app. But just to finish the point you mentioned about uh, the AFC system and all, and actually that's true. It's no more just a ticketing or payment system. It's much more the kind of data you can get through your yeah. payment app and all. It's much more important for the planning to understand the demand and also understand the, the journey pattern of people. And that's why it's important to have an integrated uh, service, a payment service, because then you can cover the people journey from door to door. And then you can understand how they're moving around the city and you can plan your service. You can plan your route. You can increase the number of buses if there is more demand to provide exactly. a better, like you said, smooth and safe transport option uh, to people. So regarding the super app, you know, many agencies are bullish about mass. So they talk about mobility as a service. But uh, you never talk about mass. For you, what is more important is to have a super app. And and just to tell people what does super app mean. So it's basically offering multiple services, including payment and financial transaction processing in a single app. So there are good examples in Southeast Asia, like Grab and GoTo, which are building super app and quite popular. But in Middle East also, Kareem has an aspiration to build a super app. And in fact, they outline their strategy to launch a super app in 2020. And right now they have 11 services, including mobility, group food, grocery, money, delivery. Uh, and they have 48 million user in, in whole Middle East and 2 million captains or driver on the, on the super app. So it's a big player to compete with. First, uh, I would love to, to know more how you are planning to compete. But also, uh, what is the plan of Citigroup to build this super app uh, and how will you extend uh, other services with mobility? So right now you're offering mobility, but how you're planning to offer grocery, let's say movie tickets, and what's your feature plan in that area? So this is, um, so super app, it's, it's, it's a very interesting area because we're, when you look at the, the, it's very much connected to the, if you, AFC, right? What is the, the, the what is AFC? If you think of it, you are bringing, so let me just tell you, it's to me, I would call it more of a fintech solution, right? Yeah. In the sense, what's happening when people are taking the journey, right? They have to pay first the money in and money stays there, right? And they take the journey. Yeah. At the same time, if you can allow people to use, and there is a mobile app, as we said. So there is always an option to generate the transit revenue as a non-transit non revenue. 
essentially, let's 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 talk about the metros, right? When you have a when you have a ticket, you go, you tap, then the barrier opens, you go inside, right? Exactly the same thing happens in the museums. Exactly the same thing happens in library. Exactly yeah. the same thing happens in in cinema theaters, right? Access, for example. So as a strategy in the Middle East, uh, with one of the, the public transport authority, when we did this, this is how it happened, right? The same AFC card or same AFC app is actually doing the access because what is AFC app doing is providing you access. You pay for yeah. it and then it provides you access to it, right? So that's an obvious area for non-transit revenue. Yeah. I mean, this can extend up to the, to, to the schools, the, for example, when school kids are going into the buses that you can do, they can have the same app and you do the attendance there, right? And then, the, and then you can provide access to the parents to see that, to the way the kids are moving, right? Which is people are in developing anything different. Now, imagine that on your mobile phones, how many apps you have for different things, right? Hmm. But there is an always an opportunity as you see that you have to come up with the, the adjacent business models, right? The adjacent yeah. business and other services. So of course, for super app for us is, is one aspect of the super app is very clearly to provide all of our mobility services because we have a range of services. As I said, the mass transit, your micro mobility, we will have a number of micro mobility services, right? And then we also, uh, some way or other, eventually we'll bring soft mobility. So all that mobility platforms on one app. Okay. Why do you have to multiple apps? You provide one app on the same app, you provide a wallet, right? So that people pay through the one single thing or the people have the, the money into the wallet and use it for other things, right? Now, when you take a journey, it's very common that you find a, a coffee shop, you go and take a coffee, right? Now you're yeah. not pulling another card, right? You've seen those magnet cards, you could fill them up and then tuck, they come out and you tell like, I yeah. hate that, I hate this. And, and this whole concept of the physical wallets, the leather wallets is going away. You don't need oh, yeah. your device. Your device is enough, right? So when you have that, so you can go because you have put the money into it. When you know that this is your for transport needs, but sometimes you know you can use it for other things. And business model is simple. Your the business model is we will be driving the you know the volume to the retailers through us, and we make a cut out of it, right mm. so out of that. This is a simple simple model of any any um, any app which you are talking about, any delivery service you're talking about, or any any other as a business model you're talking about. So the, our idea is that using the super app, using the wallet, provide our customers the service at one stop. And as we move, expand our market from Kuwait to the other markets, you know, it's easy for us to move and, you know, the, the expose the services, local services based on the geolocations, right? And it will evolve. It will continuously evolve. And more than that, there is a more than this because we, our, we as a group company, we have a airline called Jajira Airways, for example. Oh, okay. So Jajira Airways is why not when people are trying when when people are flying into Jajira Airways, why can't we have the surface and and the air uh, transport integrated both ways from yeah. their side from our side, right? So one of the biggest problem is, is worry is when you go to the new place, you say, oh, how am I going to get a taxi? Where am I going to get a taxi? How am I going to move there? This is a given solution, right? Oh yeah. One single QR code, you finish your journey, you come, you have the you have the city bus or city link shuttle or city link bus, you go QR code out. So you pay once in your ticket from home to destination, destination to your home, right? Yeah. So. So there are there's a lot of evolving business models which are coming in the super app. It's to me super app is a super app is a kind of a hype, but you know it just uh, to me is a if we say this the Kareem Kareem has a great super app. Look at the Uber has a great super app. I mean these are the super apps where you oh, provide yeah. the the transit and non transit services at one stop, right? There are other things you know if you think of the government. Uh, you pay a fee for a lot of government services, right? And in Middle East, it's little because there is no tax, but there are a lot of government fees, right? You pay, oh, yeah. right? It's easy to, this can help the, the government departments to make them cash flash, right? The people, 
store this and they pay through this, pay through the super app, which is, I don't know what we call it, but we are working designing it because as we are building up the, all the, the AFC and the, the DRT and all those services, which will be part of the same super app. And it's, it's a great service for, you know, great service for the public sector departments, yeah. right? For the, the people to pay, make it easier. If they have to renew their licenses, if you have to their penalties, Everything. You know, a lot of penalties, everything you pay through this. So you can integrate any service you like. Because the, to me, the most important part as a fintech is the money in. Then what you do with this and what how you help customers and how do you create your own value, that is the, the fintech solution. To me. I mean, one of one side of the fintech solution, one part of that. There are many other fintech solutions. That's how we're seeing it. We are seeing super app as our fintech initiative. That's great. In fact, uh, there is a there is a funny quote which say that all the bank want to be a technology company and all the technology company want to be a bank. So so I can say same for transportation. All the transportation company want to be a, a payment app and all the payment app want to become some kind of a mobility. Like if you see Apple Pay and Google Pay, they want to uh, do more work with uh, with transit and similarly transit want to develop. So I think there is a middle ground where both will work together. And I I think super app is a good thing. It's just, uh, it's not for all the countries and not all the places. And that's why we saw in some places it's more successful than other. And I think in Middle East, there is an opportunity because there are a lot of services, like you mentioned, which are not digitalized yet. And I think that's an opportunity for super app to capture that area. Many of these agencies and authority cannot develop something in house. So the super app or these kind of digital solution can be easier for them to bring uh, on board the customer and, and passenger and all. Now, my next question is, which is kind of unthinkable in Middle East two years back. Uh, it's about electric buses. Uh, many cities in the Middle East are now looking to induct electric buses and electric taxis. Uh, Riyadh has procured their first electric bus. Uh, similarly, Dubai is adding electric taxi to its fleet and uh, expanding it. How do you think the landscape in Middle East will change in the next five years? Uh, I just wanted to tap in your consultant experience about how this electrification will take place in these Middle Eastern country. And I'm pretty sure there must be a discussion going on within city group about this electrification all. So what is the city group plan to be ready for the future? Like you mentioned, lean and agile. So you have to be prepared for future. So what are you doing within city bus? Interesting. The electric uh, bus is a very interesting thing in, in the Middle East. And one of the challenge in electric bus is the temperature. Yeah. And high humidity as well. Right. So imagine, uh, you know, the Kuwait, the, during the summers around this time, the tarmac temperature can reach up to 60 degrees. I mean, I personally have seen a 52, 53 degree in on tra while traveling on the car, I've seen that temperature, right? Give you another st uh, another stat that our double-decker buses during the winters, they can do three and a half kilometers a liter. Okay. But in summers, they do 1.5, 1.6. It's like 50%. Yeah, Even because less of, the load of the, electric, the, the load on the air conditioning system, because in this, you have to run the air conditioning system, right? Very strong mm. air conditioning system. And we really literally have to switch off to save the batteries and efficiency. We have to switch off the USBs and number of other things in the, in the buses, right? Now, you have to bring, you want to bring that city, the electric bus. Mm. So one of the major challenge in electric bus is that, you know, the heat is the biggest challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, without naming that particular manufacturer, I saw one of the one of the top ma the car manufacturer. I went there and I said, "Guys, okay, how is this car look like?" I said, "It's great. How many mileage it does? It, it can do in one single charge. Oh, this can do 300 kilometers. Okay. But if you switch off this, if you switch off this, if you do this, and then then later on he came down and said, "Yeah, but if you are running under the heat." It, Better you run during that evening and mornings. Ah. You do well, but if you run in heat, and then 300 reduced down to 150. Hmm. So it's a challenge, right? As, as, the, as the technology is evolving, right? And, and particularly in terms of the battery, I don't see any other problem, but that the, in running the heavy air conditioning system is a challenge. 
Now, electric infrastructure, electric charging infrastructure is another very, very big challenge because you need to build that infrastructure. Now, in order to build it, you have to have a clear business case. You have to have the, you know, on, on the normal lines, the electric lines, you cannot run. You need to build a new substation altogether. Yeah. Altogether, a totally, totally a new infrastructure to have the charging platform. Because, so let me give you the, our example. Our city buses, in a day, they run literally 16 hours hmm. on the roads. And each bus clocks really nearly around 550 500 to 550 kilometers a day. Oh, well, that's huge. Right? Because this is how the public transport is, right? And the, the way that the, the, the whole superway city is. When we think of the electric bus, when you're in single charge, you can get the best electric bus charge, say 300, 350 kilometers. And with all those factors, it is locked down to 200. Where do we do the business, right? Mm. That's, that's, that's the biggest challenge into it. Now, the, if you look at the other region from a consultant heads, if I see it, the Abu Dhabi tried one, tried one, and the results were just very discouraging, right? Dubai has is very uh, Dubai being a very um, you know they they want to do every everything first in the world or something, they have decided to go for it. Dubai weather is uh, considering that other than the humidity is is. A much better, a lot better than Kuwait in terms of the heat. Mm. And then Dubai has the other mode of transport they can work around, right? They can yeah. they can work and they can have the, for some part of it, you can have it, right? Now, Qatar is an interesting one that because of Qatar had a pressure, um, they use the, they're using the same buses and same manufacturer, manufacturer, which we are the part, which we are the distributor as well in, in in Kuwait, so we know how they, these they, they, the technologies work. They're pretty good, decent buses, but they had no choice. They have to do it for FIFA, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the question is that we also have a plan to bring an electric bus and do the testing. We are doing all that, everything. The first thing is the cost, very expensive. Yeah. The second thing is, you know, second thing is that, you know, the operational challenges, as I said, explained to you. And we don't know, we still are trying to watch that how the Kuwait experience, how the, the Dubai experience work before we bring in into it. But a very interesting thing, what we started it, and as you know, the BMW has also done it. Sorry, I'm not promoting it, but they're, they're great. They said, we're going to go back to, uh, we are, we're not going to the electric, we go hydrogen. Hmm. To me, that makes more sense. That makes a lot more sense than electric, right? Because if you, we tend to think of in present time, we don't think of the whole life cycle of it. What do we do mm. with these batteries, right? How these batteries look at it? What so you know? Sometimes we always in Middle East look for the benchmarks to towards the West. And this time I said, this time I said that you know the Kuwait, sorry, the the West would look for the benchmark from Kuwait to understand the, how we run our lives at 60 degree temperature. Oh yeah. Right. So, so the, as a, as a, as a strategy, I don't want to rush into the electric buses because they are expensive. First of all, and having one or two buses is not going to help us and it's not going to do anything. I would rather wait and see how this spends out the, the test programs in Qatar in you know in in the UAE, and if they are successful, and they are successful, they're going taking ahead. We are fully committed to bring this in, in, into to, to the Kuwait because one of the one of our our strategy is is the, to make it greener, and that is one yeah. of the reasons. See the fleet. If you see our fleet, our fleet is uh, our fleet is is, is the is probably the youngest fleet in. in in the region, I would say, right? We are continuously buying new and we are just you know, throwing away the old fleas so that we are remain very efficient, we remain greener as much as possible considering what is available in the country. In the market. Right? No, that, that's, but, a, that's an important point you mentioned about uh, the electric buses, the heat and the, and the challenge to operate in such an extreme condition. That is correct. And there's no point. I mean, to me, I'm not 100% sure whether 
whether you know uh, it will not forecast the fire. Mm. I'm not sure. There are incidences, right? There oh, yeah. are incidences in expensive cars that you know after the accident he was was in the garage and and it caught fire, right? And imagine here you are sitting on the <laughs> the, the hottest temperature where you can get you just need a spark, right? You just need a spark. Or, or the temperature can can create the spark for you, right? Oh yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. Now, hydrogen is an interesting technology. In fact, uh, I had a lot of conversation with people. It's just people feel that it, it will take more time for hydrogen to to be more commercially available as well as make any business case. Right now, it's too expensive. I mean, even electric buses are expensive. So yeah. hydrogen is even more expensive and also the supply for fuel and all. But I'm pretty bullish about hydrogen technology. And like you said, uh, for battery buses, the other challenges, what will you do with the batteries after the end of their life? So although there are new companies, new startup emerging, which are trying to recycle those batteries, but at the same time, if you can have hydrogen vehicle, and in fact, I was reading in China, they are in, they are investing heavily now in hydrogen and all. Jap- Japanese right. are investing uh, in, uh, in Europe also. There are a lot of testing going on uh, for hydrogen vehicle in North America too. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, you also mentioned about uh, that, like, the guys who are selling these electric buses, putting so many condition for you not to do this, not to switch on the yeah. aircon or reducing. Uh, it, there was a funny joke about a guy was selling an umbrella and, and the other person asked, uh, will it last long? And he said, okay, don't use in rain and uh, sun. It will last long forever. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so I think for electric buses too, you don't switch on your aircon, don't, don't go on a high gradient and all, and the battery will last long for 300 kilometers. Yeah, it's this funny. Is, this is a, more of a practical uh, side of it, which is, which is the, you know, you cannot have considering the, the extreme weather and extreme conditions. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's one need to understand blindly. the local conditions. Yeah. You can't follow the blindly, but uh, let me tell you one more initiative we have. We are, we are not, we trying everything possible. We are, we are, we have, a, we are experimenting biodiesel. Okay. Bio That's great. As well. Right, but the question is that we have tested, uh, we have tested running our buses, we have tested the results. They are they are, they are increasing, but the only problem is that it's expensive. First of all, yeah. bio is expensive, and it's not enough. It's not enough to run, you know, the fleet of five hundred vehicles, right? The full fleet, yeah. But at least you are experimenting, which is good. At least exactly. are... we make it our effort. Maybe in certain cases where it's required, uh, we will be able to run it. Yeah. And we well, have that's run our buses. We have. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, it's uh, and, and like you mentioned, idea is to explore and be always in a startup mode. Uh, even if you are a CEO of a big company, but you always need to be a startup mode and think about what's coming next and how to experiment. And in fact, my next question is about uh, your innovation strategy side, because you are involved in the innovation space for quite long, like you mentioned in construction industry, then working in PwC and all. You co-author the innovation strategy for Crossrail London. I saw the document, quite impressive, and later developed that uh, Dubai Innovation Index, uh, which was very interesting to see, uh, comparing Dubai with many other cities around the world on innovation side, and also develop our innovation strategy for RTA Dubai, Road Transport Authority for Dubai. What are your key learning from all these projects? also, my point is many organizations, especially the big one, they develop innovation blueprint, but fail in execution. So they have a big document, but when you go and ask these organizations how they are using it, you, you see certain gaps. How can public transport organization build an innovation culture? That's an important point. Uh, not just having a document, which is prepared by a consultant, like you mentioned, which is probably away from operational reality, uh, so how can public transport organization can really build a real uh, innovation culture within their organization? That's a great question. And uh, let me tell you the, the, my, the one thing I learned in, while developing these number of innovation strategies, I mean, there, there are num- many more than what you've mentioned. See, the first thing what I learned is that innovation means different things to different people, different organizations. Oh, yes. Right. Say. So, and, and the most important part while you're developing the innovation strategy, if you want this to be a successful strategy, first thing and the most difficult thing is to define what innovation means to that organization and the people of the organization. That is, that is the most fundamental thing, right? 
I can tell you my definition of innovation is very simple, right? That an idea that converts into commercialization, that can the idea that generates money or it generates value for a public sector organization, right? Or a not-for-profit organization. Simple definition. But that's not enough, right? You need to yeah. you need to have a very clear understanding and work with all the, with the people what it means. So I'll give you an example of it. This is the two great examples. Crossrail, right? The crossrail strategy, what it meant for crossrail innovation means was the, the crossrail was saying, look, we do so many major projects, we do so many brick projects. Every time we go back to come back to the you know the, the whiteboard and we start afresh. Right? We do not learn from past, we do not carry on moving forward the IPs to the next level. And then these are, there is nobody has been incentivized for the IPs to generate develop IPs. We have done so many fantastic projects in the United Kingdom with no patents around them. Yeah. Right? There's no nothing, no com the commercial value, and we are not even created a, a value so that we can say, okay, now the UK INC can take this and go and sell it to others. Hmm. Just commercialization, right? So to me, that that who wants to be, it's, it's like a who wants to be millionaire is a making manufacturing process, right? That you can repeat it and you can make it multiple times. If you look at the, the major infrastructure projects in the UK, I was in, I was involved in, in London 2012 Olympic Park, Terminal 5, and then I got involved in the Crossrail. And there was a previously I studied the Channel Tunnel. Nobody's keeping any 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 legacy, any records or anything and IPs. IPs are being transformed through the individuals, not like a, yeah. as, a, as an institutional IP transformation. So the whole idea behind the Crossrail project was that we want to build something which we can take it to the next, 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 and make progress through these IPs and develop these IP and take it to the, you know, past the legacy. Rather than just have this project as it is, and it is, and it is like buried within that project. Yeah, yeah. So that was the whole main objective of the Crossrail project. And, and there was a more, the, the biggest success, the important part was the IP model. Hmm. So, so the, the problem is that most of these major projects are delivered under a master slave kind of a contractual agreement, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm the client. You are the contractors. You do it, whatever, do it. There is no collaboration, right? Hmm. So the IP model was fantastic. IP model was you work on this project. You create the innovation. Whatever the IP you create, the Crossrail said, we will, you, you put in some money into the idea. Crossrail will match it. The IP, whatever the IP generated, you have Crossrail project gets for free, but then then you own it. Oh, okay. And if you are, it, say there are, there were four tunnel drives, and number of number of stations. If you come up with a new idea on a four tunnel drive, the four contractors, right? On the project you share free, but later on, you commercialize it. Interesting. Right. That was the that that was the triggering point, and that was the the, the idea of the the cross rail innovation project, the strategy altogether. The objective was different. Now we come to the public sector RT innovation strategy. RT innovation strategy is is totally different idea. The one of the their objective was they want to show the continuous improvement. Hmm. They want to show the continuous, and they want to become the number one in certain services. They want to become the you know the most attractive place in the world, tourist place, and make it you know, uh, make the way as a, as a tourist attraction. So their, their objectives were totally, totally different. They wanted to bring new services, innovative services, and, you know, the new ideas and, and make things totally look different, right? So so their strategy was, there were three pillars. So they wanted to lead, they wanted to excel, and they wanted to showcase that we are the, the, the transport service, which is benchmarked across the world. Because they were tired of benchmarking you know the, the 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 Hong Kongs and Singapores and London and, and the LA, right? So so that that was the uh, the, the whole objective of the there and and of course uh, considering that this strategy came out of the the Sheikh Mohammed's strategy Dubai strategy yeah become Dubai in 20, 2015 becoming Dubai as the most innovative city in the world. So they were they so the all the public sector departments have to roll up to that. Uh, by the way, they didn't stop there. Yeah, there was a 2071 vision. So I have developed the RTA, developed the 2070 because that is their 
centenary year. They will complete the hundred years of the independence. Oh, and they okay. want to create the vision for that. Right? Very interesting thing to share with you. When you do such a long for such a long vision, your forecasting method don't work. Oh yeah. Because this is not linear exp- extrapolation. That's what I tell people. Innovation is never a linear. Yeah. So we call it I K. We called it a foresighting. So you start there at the top, and then you just then work backwards. Hmm. Right. So one of the, my prediction, one of my foresight was at that point was, you know what? The currently you have a road congestion problem in 2071. This road traffic will reduce to half. Okay. Right. So I was challenged. That how come this will happen? I said, let me tell you. You have to go back to the the humans' fundamental needs. You know, a Clayton Christensen's word called "job to be done." Jobs mm. to be done. Jobs to be done. Right. So if you think of it, why do we move? Why do we travel every day in the morning? Because we have to go to the work. We have to interact. Considering the all these new technologies and the, what pandemic has shown us, the accelerated the. You know the the virtual meetings and everything, what and and the work from home culture. Why would we go travel? Why do I need yeah. to go? Right at the peak hours, I will go when I when I see it, it, there's no traffic. Only way we need it, humans, we are we need a physical physical interactions in some form or other and face to face, right? So if you think of that and then you take it to 2071, even I'm saying half, it might go back to. It might go back to the one fourth, mm-hmm. right? Can I share you one very interesting thing which I did for a consultant? Yeah. The U.S. airports, their 40 percent revenue comes from the parking. 40 percent. That's that's a yeah. huge number. Yes, their forty percent revenue in the U.S. airports come from parking, right? Now, with the autonomous vehicles, the parking revenue will go away, right? So every single, so I did it for without naming the the organization. There is a design engineering for for which I did the innovation strategy, right? And in and particularly in the transport sector, it was made it very very clear. So every single future project which is being designed in U.S. is designed to consider the autonomous vehicles. Hmm. Very interesting. See, the, the, at the end of the day, it's not gone away. It's the change, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. these auto pods, the autonomous pods, to go and park somewhere, they, they they need a home somewhere, right? And the people will not own it. Why would I own my auto port when I can order it and arrive and I just use it, finish it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the other industries also have a threat, but I'm saying that the airports, now any airport in the US designed considering the fact that they're going to lose this 40% revenue. They have to think alternative to make that happen. That's, that's huge. So this is another example of the, the innovation strategy for a design engineering. Firm. How should they, they go and tell and how should they do work with them? Now you share some some very interesting point. Uh, one is the future traffic projection. You can't just have a linear approach and think, oh, you know, right now we have fifty people, fifty vehicle on the road. Tomorrow it will be sixty, and then after ten years it will be eighty. Probably it will be twenty. Like what happened after pandemic? Uh, what you predicted for twenty seventy, I think is becoming true in twenty twenty two because uh, not many people are traveling. People are. Uh, reducing their travel for work and they're going on their own time. Uh, in Europe, there are more t- uh, traveler in the public transport during weekend than on weekdays because people love to go on leisure trip than, than on work trip. So so we are seeing already seeing those changes. In fact, uh, Uber released their quarter two earning. And one of the interesting fact is their ride hailing trips increased by 55% over the year. Uh, but their delivery trips also increase by 7%. So there is no correlation that uh, that the ride hailing will increase and the delivery will stop. Like it's not that people will stop ordering food online and all. So both will grow, but some will be more pace and some will be lower. So I think what you are predicting for 2070 is true. Probably you don't need 
wider road probably you need the other kind of infrastructure and and that's uh, sharing that facts about i think for public transport also it's not only for the airport uh, it's for public transport organization also it's important to understand there will be a fair revenue and there'll be a non fair revenue and they have to think about those alternative method i i i can now connect with your idea of super app because you feel that's a way to grow you become a fintech company rather than just become a mobility company and and just provide the buses but you provide end to end services to people whether it's paying their parking bill paying for their grocery paying for movie tickets and all and do everything in one service so thank you for sharing that it's it's quite interesting as a consultant i can see how to yeah. bring together all these pieces great right. yeah so now i actually want to talk something which is very close to your heart uh, startup uh, startups are important for fostering innovation in the mobility sector however it's not a easy space to work as you have to deal with policy maker city official you have to work with public sector organization uh, especially in the mobility world you were a startup founder yourself and launch arna mobility to operate micro mobility and e scooter e scooter operation in uae and uh, you have a first hand experience of entrepreneur life which i'm i'm sure it was not easy during that time but now you are on the other side of the spectrum and you are a ceo of a transport company uh, and you must be meeting a lot of startup founder who are coming to you to do pilots or projects and uh, exploring some uh, project uh, opportunity paid project opportunity with you so any lesson would you like to share with uh, both founder and the public transport operator being on both side and how do you promote innovation uh, at city group uh, do you have a special program to engage with startup do you mentor these people uh, or how do you work with the startup in the company great i mean this is a this is one of the questions which i always love to share my experience with with the with the founders and the entrepreneurs so let me start with the first part of it which is about the the policy makers and how difficult is the life uh, you know getting the policy authorities approvals and and getting the policies done so one of the things if you look at the the startups right look at the startups like uber or startups the electric scooters is one of the great examples the start of the autonomous vehicles you know one of the test one of the test for a real innovation is basically if there is no regulation exists that means you are on the right path uh-huh. right If you have a regulation, that means this is not innovation. This is already existing, right? This is just a, you doing an incremental improvement. You're not you're not innovating something, right? So, considering that in mind, uh, when I was working with this start this startup, you mean the previous startups, and in my experience, I developed a very interesting model. I call it eight layer model. Okay. Right. Any entrepreneur, any any startup company or any startup entrepreneur has to go through these eight layers and and test. your idea against these and and so these let me explain what are these eight layers there are there are a couple of layers which is talk about the demand right that who is needs it what's the use cases for it and how they going to what's the problem statement of it right yeah. the second couple of layers are all about the supply how are you going to do it what is the mode of it is a technology platform or it's a physical platform or it is going through a your supply channels distribution channels how you going to do the supply for it right yeah and so leaving the middle layer out then the next comes is the infrastructure part of it the bottom the layer is about infrastructure part of it the infrastructure part is important because that's where you say where the funding is coming from you know the what what platforms you need and other things there's of course there is a there is a layer which talks about the technology platform as well but the most important thing which most entrepreneurs do not think and they ignore that and they never budget it for it as well it's the legal advocacy the policy authority layer yeah right you have to budget it you have to have the person who is helping you in opening it up you have to think about working with the with the with the regulators and the policy makers where you where which whichever market you want to go and and have that and it and 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 then it comes with the cost so yeah. when you going for funding or we are allocate developing building your budget you have to have that right give you the example very simple example of the when you were doing this urban mobility right you just go for a bit they need a when you when they go for it, we we work with the with the with the rta and the abu dhabi authority 
you know, you go there and you talk to them. When they when we they they finally after that they decided to bid for it. Now when you're bidding for it, the, to get the, the location, you have a you have to have a bid bond, you have to have a performance bond, you need funding, right? And then they said, oh, for the scooters, um, when you're running it, uh, you need to have a li- number plate, license plate, and you have to pay for the license plate, right? You never oh, yeah. thought about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never budget so those things. Exactly. And sometimes to help you, you might have to get some experts. You might have to get a consultant to help you. And then you have to have a legal guys and, and policy guys to work with you. So this layer, which is, I call it a, a fundamental second last layer, which is mostly ignored by the entrepreneurs. Right? So that model is a very good t- test for any entrepreneur to test whether this idea is on the right path or not. And once you've done it, then helps you build your whole business plan, your your operations plan, and everything, right? Marketing plan and how you go to market strategy, your your customer market. So that's that's the one part. And then second part, as you as you said, what I I I learned. I mean, what I as a as a CEO or as a what I've learned and where that the mature businesses should look for the, the startups and how they support them. So let me tell you that. The thing is that right now, the way we are in a technology acceleration phase, to me, the every business is somewhere or other is on a startup phase. The, the businesses is like a, a, like a software platform, right? Yeah. Just like I give this example. So when I say, show them that, look, you have this car, when I show you Tesla, say, what do you see? They said car. No, actually not. That's not a car. That's a piece of software. The, every time you upgrade the software, the functionality changes. Yeah. It's, it changes completely. It's a new product altogether, right? We are in the same phase, right? In the mobility sector, today you see where the mobility, mobility is today is right in the middle of many things, right? You're talking EV, you're talking hydrogen, you're talking fuel cell, you're talking uh, digital, the mass mobility, you're talking autonomous, you're talking, I don't know, all sorts of things, right? Yeah. So where are we in the mobility space? We are in a startup phase, right? We are in the startup phase. People are talking, you can do the fleet management this way. You can do the planning this way. So to me, and then the customer's behavior is a change, right? Because the customers are saying, oh, but if I can get, if I can get my food ordered through a Uber Eat or something through my mobile phone, why can't I get my, uh, the mobility solution? Of that? Why can't oh, I get yeah. my right to that, right? So the people, they, they, they got, the world got so much exposed to these technologies. So we are all in a startup mode. So there is no way, there is no way we can stand still. No way we can, we cannot, we cannot survive without doing that, right? So to me, the way I look at it, the way as a, as a company we look at it for the startups is we, we don't wait for to build companies to come. We do have a program. We welcome anybody who comes and offer to us. We do have a, a, a part of the section in our, our team who constantly looking for the ideas and, you know, anybody who comes through the, our social media platforms, anything, we respond to them. Okay. For us, every idea is a great idea. Every idea is a great idea. We do not throw any idea. It's just that what is our priority, Yeah. where you want to go, where it fits in our strategy, right? That's how we look at the ideas. But more than that, we are, we also take a very active role in it. We scout for the new technologies because we know, we know what we need, right? And yeah. we also, uh, continuously scout, we reach out to the entrepreneurs and we are open and we have created in our budgets a, a fund for developing the IP, developing the technologies further and implementing for our needs. So as, as a city group, uh, we are always looking for technology and we are currently working with a couple of, you know, the new startup, new partners and helping them develop and you know, working very closely to prototype, giving them the platform to prototype Recently, uh, in, in world like a Kuwait, they wanted to uh, experiment with the biodiesel. Hmm. Um, well, the diesel is plenty in the country, yeah. but bio is not enough. But <laughs> still, still, the people love the the KFC and the McDonald's, right? There's enough bio. So they, the the the, the university, Kuwait University, wanted to, and then and there's a company in, which is trying to produce the biodiesel out of the they use cooking oil, we openly helped them uh, do the, you know, they gave them our buses, our platform, and tested these biodiesel. You know, if you know the chemistry, and 
we just based on the chemistry we said well let's go into it the good news is that we, we were succeeded in that we could run our vehicles and we results were very encouraging right that's great so so you know uh that way we are very open to it and i think this is my advice to every single you know operator or company in the mobility sector because mobility sector in i think in the next at least in next two years has to go through a tremendous amount of changes oh yeah technology and all our technological changes whether it's a technology in the pure sense not just the the, the computer technology or, or telecommunication technology i'm talking about technology as a whole oh yeah in terms of in, in terms of the electrics, hydrogen, fuel cells, and everything. So we, in the next two years, are going to be very exciting, very, very exciting. And, and you know, a lot of the new startups have to come and a lot of new ideas have to be in that space. I think this is a, I call it is a, people used to call golden era, I call it platinum era for the mobility sector right now. I, I love your answer, platinum era for for mobility sector, and and I think yeah. what you said is absolutely right. Uh, every company need to be in a startup mode because the way we are seeing transformation happening in the mobility sector. I mean, next two year we will see a major push, and like you said, technology. A lot of people think it's just a software and uh, a device and all, but uh, technology means everything. You know, your engine technology, your uh, operation. It's also mean how you are managing your fleet and running your depots and uh, providing services to people and all and for startup uh, i agree that's the biggest test if if there is no regulation if policy maker has no clue it's uh, it's innovation or it's something new if if they already have a regulation for you then then it's not an innovation for example urban air mobility now every city is thinking about how should they regulate there is a there is a regulation for aeroplanes and helicopters and drone but now urban air mobility nobody has any any regulation so they are now thinking about it now thanks for sharing this and i really love your perspective eight layer to check whether that idea fit into innovation or not uh, now my last question is about the startup ecosystem in middle east and uh, and we all are very surprised to see how the startup ecosystem has evolved in middle east in last uh, i would say in four five year uh, after seeing Kareem as the one company coming out of it, but now you're seeing more and more company coming from the from the Middle East, especially from Dubai, which is emerging as a crypto hub, and uh, Riyadh, which is emerging as a startup hub as well for Middle East as as well as for global world. Now we see company like Saval from Egypt now, which is global. They are they are serving uh, clients everywhere around the world. So how do you see the the startup ecosystem will evolve in next decade in Middle East? Uh, what are the area where we see uh, major thing happening? And any advice you would like to share with the founder who are building company in the Middle East or who are looking to enter into the Middle East uh, because you you work in that region for so long, so you know how the system work, uh, how are things changing? So what is your advice? Great question. I mean, I think. Uh... The, the very interestingly, the way the shift is happening, the shift from, uh, you know, when in our, about a decade ago, when we thought about the startup ecosystem, it was the Silicon Valley, that's it, right? And then how others have started picking up and, and trying to build the ecosystem and trying to develop the same, uh, they've started seeing that how startups can add the big value in a very short period of time, uh, you know, they reach to the growth and very very quickly on the growth curve if they are the good ideas yeah the the, the one fundamental concept let me tell you the way that the things are uh, interestingly happening so a few years ago i developed this dubai innovation index for for comparing the city's competitiveness in terms of the innovation and yeah and we compared uh, we, and we did it particularly for dubai and this project actually won uh, the dubai excellence award from from the from from the Dubai government and it won that World Chamber of Congress award. The interesting piece was that that every country, every city, every city is is good at something, right? Right. And then we had a scoring mechanism to put a one, two, three, four, five ranks among the top thirty cities. Then you can compare in each element who is doing what, what, which. So the idea was that Dubai, we were we told Dubai that look at what in this particular area who is doing better and you're not doing it. So you develop mm. your policies to go to that, right? So let me tell you, 
scientifically it was great but if i summarize that dubai innovation index we did almost five editions of this right dubai gone up and down every city gone up and down and pandemic has another effect in essence there are only two things on which to the cities compete in world in terms of the innovation it's fdi foreign direct investment and the talent yeah. and it's a vicious circle if the city has the foreign direct investment you have the talent if you have a talent you have a foreign direct investment in summary if i summarize you if there are only two things these are the only two things there's, there's nothing called third thing in it right and and this is what exactly what is happening wherever you have a funding you get ten talent comes in that now the challenge what uh, and the, and you know it's not just the middle east it's every other part yeah. of the world the good great city is trying to build this right and you know what maybe the funding is not the problem the problem is the talent not every part of the world has the right talent what you need it yeah right the third element i'll come back to you is about ip as well so ip ip regulations ip generation creating the value ip value and making it ip allowing monetizing the ip that that's something important that's the third thing but it's output of it not part of these two now if you look at the the places like why the silicon valley got successful is very clear right the number of university education system and and, and old education system looking at the incubators in cambridge and oxford you know the age of the cambridge and oxford oxford is 900 years old cambridge is 800 years old wow so this whole you know the the talent and the sustained talent and building up that it takes time it takes effort it takes a longer time right there is no shortcut to it there is absolutely no shortcut to it right so this challenge will remain with the with the developing you know the developing economies and economies which are trying to develop these new innovation ecosystems like in dubai or saudi arabia or or any other part in the middle east they will always struggle with that they will always have to be you know the conscious that they ha- they have to, in order to build this ecosystem they have to build this whole education system higher education system research ecosystem right very 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 strong yeah and i think there is a, some focus on it but but you know there are certain things you cannot buy certain things you cannot buy right talent is one of them you cannot even if you can you can attract the talent when the ch- next challenge comes retaining the talent yeah right and that challenge will remain these uh, these these countries so 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 they're doing great they're doing great they're supporting and they're making it easy they're providing all the all the you know support what is needed and you know how long they become sustainable is always the main question mark but i wish them all good luck all the best right so and the another thing is if you don't make efforts you don't get it oh yeah so so uh, the, i really appreciate this effort that what the efforts we made into create these startups and that create the creating these ecosystem but a lot of work is needed a lot of work is needed to compete and build this as a sustainable ecosystem right so as a as if the advice to the founders to to come into the middle east and everything yes it's a great part it's a great platform but you know most important part is as i said about ip focus on your ip mm-hmm. and focus on developing a global ip not just the local ip or making sure that ips are protected ips are properly developed and, and, and not necessarily go for the patent or necessarily go for the you know the global patents and things like that but it's a, it's an ip which you have to focus on because then ip is transferable ip is transportable right you can mm-hmm. take if you have a solid strong ip you can go any part mm-hmm. of the world you can do that right yes in order to select the market considering uh, considering the middle east is is a great place to go uh, to test your idea and do that because they are more flexible in terms of in terms of the, the the helping you develop or getting you develop the policies and the, and the regulations around it yeah so in developed countries to so getting the the regulation sorted out takes a lot longer than it's easier to get it done in in the in the countries which are developing and aspire to develop for example dubai you know dubai was the probably the first uh, the con- first con- uae i would say the first country where you had the the minister of artificial intelligence right yeah it's 
it's it's it's is that so there it, so you know if you have a ip which is your your ip you develop and it is a good great these markets are great platform to test and great platform to you know launch your uh, the products and, and test and prototype right markets are not big that's true but they, they you have to go look for the bigger markets where you have the scale but for testing everything these these platforms are good and they have developed a good right uh, ecosystem and yeah. that's a great answer and i i love what you mentioned is that there is no shortcut to success so it will take time for these countries or city to build ecosystem uh, not every city can be silicon valley but at the same time there are we are seeing these green shoots of uh, innovation happening in some of these places the funding is uh, coming the vcs are setting up base in middle east and now uh, things are rolling out and uh, the talent is important thing and and if you look at country like singapore that's what they have they have a great amount of talent and then it attract fdi and then the the virtuous cycle start the talent lead to more investment and investment lead to more talent coming to the country and i think i think middle east also is on a right path a lot of people are going back now after studying outside uh, in states and in in uk they are going back and setting up base there but but i i like your advice it's a it's a great place to work just be make sure about your ip and then regulation you can get it done not very easily but at the same time people listen to you and probably they can create and and dubai especially they are the first one to create regulation for urban air mobility or drone uh, which is uh, remarkable because they start thought thinking about these thing i remember it's like 3 year back when nobody was even thinking about it so they start early so these are good place to work so thank you dheeraj i i love our conversation we discuss about transit we discuss about technology we discuss about uh, latest trend in innovation and all but now it's time for a rapid fire question round and i'll ask you five question and you need to answer them quickly the idea is to know more about your personal side rather than just your professional journey so if you're ready i'll start my questions yeah please fire i'm ready okay. always ready. Uh, so if you are not in academia innovation or consulting sector what other profession you would have selected well professional golfer yeah what that's what i would have select i would love to be because that's that's the game i love yeah and if not, then astronaut because that's astronaut. that's my yeah i love to go and explore yeah no i i i think you are one of the future candidate for this blue origin or virgin atlantic flight so probably going to the space very soon and experience that uh, gravity and weightlessness absolutely um, just waiting for the few more successful <laughs> not to not to be a early risk taker in that sense uh, now you have travel in fact you not only travel you lived in different part of the world uh, so my next question is which is your favorite city in the world it's it, it's london and i uh-huh. i love it for the reason that uh, it's a very cosmopolitan it's a city where you can be be by yourself nobody ask you who you are and it's just you know is vibrant it's it's just a fantastic place to live yeah no so i think that's here. a uh, yeah so my home is just outside of london but i like to be in london all the time no it's a it's a great city and like you mentioned it's a cosmopolitan nobody ask you where are you from another other good point of these cities that you can experience and taste different culture different food and meet different people around the world in a in a same place so it's like a mini world in a one small city uh now you love transit you use public transport you're working in this sector so you must be using public transport in whichever city you're visiting so which city has the best transit network in the world well to me there's no one west but i have to the london for the accessibility and approachability and its ease of you know getting the public transport but singapore is is comparable and it's it's probably the at same level but in terms of the quality i would say the singapore is the number one the quality of the public transport the neat neat and clean and, and the nice you know the public transport service is the same Oh, yes. and it's it's yeah. new uh, singapore is new and london is a little bit old so that's also a reason it make a little bit different but london is more interconnected and and singapore is uh, like you mentioned it's better 
manage and clean and so it make it a little different but both are amazing system i've been to both side of the world so i have seen both the system it's it's amazing yeah. now my next question is uh, which is your favorite startup in the mobility sector of course the city link shot what <laughs> okay. no rajesh apart uh, i think the to me in mobility sector uber i would give uber. all credit to uber they were the pioneer they were the first one to transform their into the shared mobility to the digitalization and all that. so i would give a lot of credit to uber yeah But, it's it's my past employer you know i worked with uber for one year so right. love that answer and and i think uber one thing they did is they start this whole concept of on demand economy and sharing economy which was not there but after that we see a lot of innovation in that space and a lot of work happen in that space uh, so love your answer now my last question if you can change one thing in your life what would it be well being a transport sector and person i would say remove i will delete all the cars from the earth all the cars yeah so the car free world is is that's what my dream is yeah i i think in in riyadh in in saudi they are building this neom which is a 170 mile long city with no roads and no car so it'll be very interesting to see that experiment how people will accept that change because we born seeing the road and connectivity and cars so once you remove the road and the car from the from the life how the life will look like so we will we will see that no great i loved your answer thank you so much dheeraj for your for your great insight i really loved our conversation and learn a lot from your experience uh, you have such a rich experience in consulting and innovation in transport and uh, and construction i love something really new about construction as well so thank you for for sharing your time and thoughts with us yeah thanks very much jaspal it was uh, thanks for having me here and, and you know giving me opportunity to share some of my thoughts i believe at this stage in my career the my philanthropy is to share knowledge and i love that thank you very much thanks oh, it's very true it's very true you know sharing your knowledge and experience is important so thank you so much thank you for listening to this podcast we'll be inviting some other inspiring guests in coming week You can subscribe to this podcast online to get the notification for the next episode. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to give us a five-star rating as it will help us to spread our message. If you have any feedback or suggestion for this podcast, please do write to us at info@theretmobility-innovators.com. At I look forward to see you next time. Thank you.